do this again? Yeah. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, we have nothing to report out of closed session. Um, Adoption and approval of the agenda yeah, for today. I'll move to approve the agenda. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Okay, now we get to the good stuff. Students of the Month for October 2019. Trustee Quinn is going to be. <coughs> All right, can I get the reps from Kenilworth?
He is always very positive no matter what we are working on or doing in class. He is always helping other students, whether that is giving positive reinforcement, encouragement, or if it is helping explain a problem a different way. I can always count on David to come, with, come in with a big smile. Miss Woldemar, David's English teacher, is enthused. Amazing! David brings a good energy to class and everyone he sits around. He is a confident student and does amazing work. Miss Rennie, his robotics teacher, remarks, David is a model student. He goes above and beyond my expectations every time. He finishes his work early and then helps other students who actually want his help. A substitute teacher wrote by his picture, an awesome student. David likes, David plays soccer with the Brasino Soccer League as a left midfield. He enjoys the sport and plays as often as he can. David's love of family is apparent. He makes time to play with his baby brother and helps out around the house. He walks his 19-year-old dog in between homework, chores, and play with his baby brother. David maintained a 4.0 GPA in seventh grade and is continuing his perfect GPA in eighth grade. David takes pride in his effort in school and good grades. He hopes to go straight to university after high school. He says, I'm trying to be a good person with everything I do. Congratulations, David. <laughs> Carson Coleman is one of our October 2000. 
2019 Students of the Month. Carson was born on August 8, 2005 at Marin General in Greenbrae. He is a great student, with quick with a smile, and is an excellent and passionate musician. Carson also has quite a flair for design. So far this year, Carson has been earning excellent grades. His math teacher comments, Carson participates in class discussions and volunteers to share his solutions to problems. He is kind to everyone and is a great team player. As a student at Cherry Valley, he was part of the straw program, Student and Teachers Restoring a Watershed which made an important impact on him and gave him a deep sense of responsibility caring for the planet. Another teacher talks about Carson's compassion and kindness. Carson is kind to all people and he comes into contact with. He is inclusive of all and very respectful. Carson often offers to help teaching staff. Carson is inquisitive and displays excellent critical thinking skills. He's a wonderful role model for his peers and I feel lucky to have him as one of my students. Carson is also interested in fashion. One of his life goals is to work for a famous fashion designer, such as, such as R. J. Anderson or Ralph Simons, two of his favorites. Carson's biggest passion is music. He listens to all types of music and just started his own band with three friends. <laughs> He's a long-standing member of the PJHS Symphonic and Jazz Bands and one of our key percussionists. This year, he will be participating in the Sonoma County Honors Band as well. His band teacher is full of praise. Carson is one of the most thoughtful students that I've had in the symphonic band, and he happens to be one of my best percussionists. He's always there to help out students if they have questions within the percussion section, and is always prepared for class. His parents have to say this about their son. Carson has always been a very caring and compassionate person. In preschool, he would hug other kids if they got hurt. Recently, recently a friend was stuck on assignment, and Carson helped him during lunch so that the other student would turn his homework on time. Carson also has a great sense of humor. Like his grandfather, he is always good at making up jokes. Carson Coleman is a wonderful student, humanitarian, and musician, and a Boone to Petaluma Junior High. We are proud to present him for the Student of the Month Award. has helped him to challenge himself in school as well. His favorite school subjects are science and math. He plans on pursuing a career in mechanical engineering. He competed in Science Olympiad at his former school and founded a Costa Grande team this year. The team will compete in February at CSU East Bay against teams from around the Bay Area. Since this is the team's first year, Peyton hopes that it grows and does well in the future. He is very excited for the rest of this school year and to be graduating as a gaucho. Thank you. And then first I will have Zahara Cuevas Devon. 
Thomas. Any, any engineering and computing skills to help the community. 
They've also done some fun projects, like a 3D augmented reality sandbox, which she also presented at SSU. Outside of school, Carlos and his family attend a Christian church, in which he also volunteers and serves. He serves in the youth ministry, as well as the worship team. He is the drummer. Carlos has shown his good discipline and diligence at school and anything else he does. Keeping good grades, always try, trying his best during every race and wrestling match, helping his community and school. Carlos, Carlos hopes to keep making a positive impact everywhere he goes.
all of our brilliant students go do their homework. <laughs> 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 we'll be back You're welcome to stay in the Of course. Jenna Parisi, and our intern, Stacey Brown. And from Casa Grande, we have Julie, who I can never see her last name. <laughs> oh, her. Yeah, uh, Shauna Friedman, and I think those are the only two from Casa. Yes. Kathy Jell and Paul Cooney can be here today. And then we have our wonderful counselor, Sherry Lee, who's working between multiple sites. So she's wearing a lot of hats as a different type of counselor this year. So um, yeah, so here we're here tonight to talk to you guys about 
can go to the next slide, about what school counseling is and what is it we do. So uh, we're overlooked or overseen by American School Counseling Association or ASCA. So that's really the umbrella of where you know, our foundation of what we try to do day to day working with students comes from. We um, are supposed to focus in three domains, the academic domain, the career development, and then personal and social development. And that happens through a wide variety of factors, one-on-one -on -one counseling, our classroom guidance, group counseling, and other various activities that we do throughout the year for our parents. So how do we make all that happen? So in the academic development domain, we have a variety of in-class activities, uh, meetings, events where we support the academic development of our students. So we're supporting what the teachers are doing in the classroom, what the administrators are doing, and we do that in a variety of ways. Uh, our introduction to high school in ninth grade is an in-class presentation to freshmen about why you should care about high school credits, college requirements, why all that matters. We develop educational plans with each student so they have a roadmap for their future and hopefully have some, some goals or at least get them thinking about making some goals. Uh, we've really tried to integrate academic vocabulary as many of you know, we live in a world of acronyms and education, and we have plenty of them in, uh, in the counseling realm as, as well. So we talk about A through G requirements. So instead of college entrance requirements, it's A through G requirements, which is the terminology that the University of California uses. So trying to get the students uh, used to that terminology early on in high school so when they hear those terms, it'll actually mean something to them. And again, we, we are part of active members of the IEP teams for the uh, individual education plans for students in special education. We also conduct all of the student study team meetings. So when a student is referred either by a teacher or a parent uh, for a possible uh, looking at assessment for special education or for students who are struggling academically, behaviorally, we schedule the, the student study team meetings and coordinate with the teachers and parents to to put uh, together plans to get those students back on track. Uh, in addition, uh, Section 504 plans, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, the, those are typically generated by uh, either a parent or request uh, a letter from a medical professional uh, or if a student has some type of condition that's interfering with their educational progress, then we look at developing a 504 plan to give them some accommodations to be successful in the, in the regular ed setting. We also conduct college application workshops uh, for not only our four-year college going students, but also a big part of that is our, uh, our, our Santa Rosa JC bound students. The Santa Rosa JC Jumpstart program, which started at CASA, <laughs> went to Petaluma High and then went countywide. <laughs> we pioneered here in Petaluma. Uh, it's been a successful partnership with Santa Rosa Junior College staff who come to our campus, and uh, Ms. Paul is coordinating it this year. I'll give some kudos to her. And run students through the whole matriculation process during their senior year. So everything they need to do to be fully ready to go for Santa Rosa JC in the fall, they can do at the CASA campus. So they get uh, assistance with the application process, orientation process, uh, understanding what types of classes they need, need and then the carrot at the end is they get priority registration, which all of us who went to college, we know that it's worth its weight in gold. <laughs> and got stuff with those 8 a.m. classes and all that kind of stuff. Especially biology. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think against And then also, uh, every January, we, we go into classrooms at both sites and do course sign-up presentations for uh, students in grades 9 through 11. So looking at what they're going to take it's next year. actually 8 through 11. Correct, yes. So we re thank you. We reach out to the junior high as well and uh, get them signed up for their courses for next year. And then, of course, that goes into the, the greater master scheduling process for the site, working with the site principals. Uh, we also uh, look at early assessment plan presentations. We have a great partnership at both sites with 10,000 degrees which uh, for those of you who may not know is a local Sonoma Marin nonprofit that their mission is to get more students in college, two-year, four-year trade schools, traditionally underrepresented populations. Uh, they hire fantastic staff. We get them free of charge, they have advisors, and many of them are 
young folks who have just graduated from college themselves and, and walk the walk. And uh, so they're great mentors and great partners for us. And we also do senior, junior and senior conferences. Uh, these are one-on-one -on -one meetings with the students at, at the junior level to really look at that senior year and at the senior level to make sure everything's kosher toward graduation or if it's not putting extra supports and plans in place, alternative ed, those types of things. And at Petaluma High, the overachievers, they also do <laughs> sophomore <laughs> conferences. <laughs> But it costs it goes into the sophomore classes during that time. Yeah. So they were also working their sophomores. Um, and then of course personal social development, which this is a huge part of our job and continuously growing. So we spend a good portion of our time one on one with our students. Um, so you know we might call them in because they're struggling with a class and then come to find out that maybe their parents got a divorce or maybe they're, you know, there's something big going on. We hear it all. I mean Every day we hear something new. I don't think this job ever gets tiring of the stories that come through our office. I've been doing this job for seven years, but it's been doing it for longer. But you always hear new things about students as to really what's behind the scenes going on that's preventing them, whether it's not being well in classes or attendance, or on the flip side, kids that are miraculously doing well despite all the things that they're going through. Um, and then we work really closely with them um, to try to find them extra support where we can. We do try to work with a lot of our community partners. We, um, at those sites have had Youth Thrive, or it's through Side by Side, it's gone through some changes over the years. They run a group each semester at either site, um, and so they're able to support a small number of students. They usually have about eight to 10 students in those programs. We at each site have um, at least maybe like a part-time MFT intern there. We'll talk about that more later. And then we do some group counseling. And then really what we do is we try to rely on the outside community partners in the area. So Mentor Me and 10,000 Degrees, like Brett alluded to, and a lot of the other ones. But part of the problem that you know makes our job really challenging is there's frankly just not a lot of resources out there. A lot of families either don't have the insurance or the money to pay for it. There's long wait lists. Or sometimes there's parents that just really don't feel, they, there's still such a stigma around counseling that they're like, well, no, we can't go send our child off to therapy, that means something's wrong. And so, you know, then that means that we're spending a lot more in-depth time with those students, um, which is one of the big challenges. So, you know, sometimes when people have to call people back, it's because maybe we were dealing with a student for two hours that was in crisis. Um, so those are some big parts of our job. So on the career development strand, uh, we do a number of activities throughout the year. Uh, at the 10th grade level, we do career presentations in the classroom in partnership with 10th grade English teachers, an iSearch project, where the counselors, uh, we do a presentation, give them some web-based tools to do some career exploration. You know, in the old days, we did those little scantron and both, you know, what would you like to work outside? Oh. You should be a park ranger. Basically, they have far more sophisticated uh, uh, programs online now where students can really learn a lot about themselves, their personality types, their skills, their interests. And then the flip side is, is in their English class, the, the teacher leads them in a project, in a paper. Usually they choose a career or, or a couple of careers to, to research about how to get to that point as far as educational requirements and things like that. Also at the 10th grade level, uh, we do employment readiness workshops, which is really more of a here and now. Uh, so a lot of our 10th grade uh, with a lot of the students being 14 or older can legally work and thankfully now there's jobs for everybody who wants them so we get into the classrooms and do a workshop on how to get a job where to look for a job how to prepare for a job interview um, you know where where are the good places to find jobs for teenagers in terms of online resources a career career center um, developing resumes uh, really trying to get them uh, broadly literate and in those career preparation areas. And also uh, both sites, we offer job shadows and also our senior projects and a, a shout out to uh, Crystal at uh, Petaluma High who's the College and Career Center Coordinator and Valerie Alston who's the College and Career Center Coordinator at Casa Grande. They do a tremendous amount of work uh, developing relationships out in the community, making connections for students to do job shadows connecting them with a myriad of, of programs that come to us and say, we want to present here or have somebody go there. So they really do a lot of triage for us. And uh, Valerie's actually developed a database of students by their senior year 
what their interests are. So then when we get a random email, here's a job shadow for this type of career, she'll actually have a database of students that may be interested in that. So we really tried to embrace technology that way. And again, uh, a lot of the outside programs that come to us for uh, either for teachers or counselors to nominate, girls and boys state, tomorrow's leaders today, there's a host of these summer type enrichment programs. And so we are often the, the the middleman or the the source to to refer students to those programs. Yeah, that program is a hard one to do as a referral from the counseling department. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, and then of course we do a lot to engage not just our students but also our parents. We provide several different evening events throughout the year. Um, so outside of the school day, at times when our parents can get there. So everything from nuts and bolts of high school and students are entering in, and then lots of various college nights throughout the year, both geared towards our seniors as well as geared towards our younger grade levels that are just, you know, really starting to understand what college looks like. Um, we do, of course, eighth grade preview nights to um, help get the people coming in ready for high school. Um, and then other things with AP honors nights and things like that. And um, a lot of awards recognition, especially our, in their senior year, it seems like there's an award tonight every week throughout the spring. Um, <laughs> but I mean, all good things, getting students lots of different scholarship money. And that's something where I know both Chris and Valerie both sites help a lot with at Pagluma High last year too. Uh, our seniors got over $250,000 in scholarship money and that was through a lot of the work that Chris and our College and Career Center did. So helping make it possible for students to afford their futures. So challenges. Uh, mental health uh, and then is, is, our, is becoming a much larger issue both in the community as well as the school sites. Both Petaluma High, Casa Grande, and, and I venture to say all of our school sites in the district have really seen a tremendous uptick in the last five years uh, with anxiety, depression, uh, the youth either diagnosed or undiagnosed, um, those symptoms are spilling over into the school setting. That in turn is triggering a lot of 504 plans. Uh, so where we used to have more time to sit down and say, you know, hey, Johnny, what would you like to do with your future? Oftentimes that's interrupted with a phone call from, can you come get so-and-so out of class? You know, they're having a meltdown. And so we're doing a lot of crisis management. The, the good thing is we have the support of the, the marriage family therapist interns that, from the district, uh, and they're usually getting pretty booked up by this time of the year with referrals, which Good and bad, depending on how you look at it, but there is a support system there. Excuse and me, then, what's the federal plan? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So Section 504 plan, that's a federal civil rights legislation that essentially entitles anyone with a documented disability to have accommodations yeah. in the school setting or the employment setting. And like many of the federal laws, it's very broad. You know, it can literally be a cut on your finger all the way up to cancer and everything in between. So, and it's different than an IEP. Yes. 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 A ge it's a general education accommodation. So, when those plans are developed, it requires us to set up a meeting. Generally, it'll be a parent referral. They'll have a, a letter from a, a doctor or a, a clinician uh, that says the student is you know, experiencing, they have a diagnosis of anxiety or, or, you know, any number of things. And we put together a team of teachers, with their teachers, a counselor, school psychologist, ideally an administrator, but they're usually so booked up with other meetings. And we put together a plan for uh, accommodations to help them be successful in their classes. So depending on the nature of their disability, and that's in the general ed setting. Uh, and then also scheduling, uh, that's uh, what's, what's really interesting now is where we have students all over the place. It used to be, you know, you had a master schedule and the first two weeks were crazy while everybody was adding and dropping and then it just kind of settled down. Now we're constantly talking with students about concurrently enrolling at the junior college and classes. There's probably a good dozen or so online providers out there that provide accredited online classes for students. Uh, so our students are literally uh, all over the country <laughs> uh, in terms of the type of um, educational experiences. So we're, we're you know, building that into their plans and it adds some interesting dimensions when you're looking at planning and things like that. Um, and also, we, uh, both sites, we administer the, the, the practice SAT, the PSAT. 
uh, Petaluma High you know, there was on the Saturday this year. We did it on a school day, so it was nice to have that option for students uh, for equity uh, to have a, a school day administration as well as a Saturday administration. Uh, we're asked more and more to be the administrative designee at IEP meetings for individual ed educational plans. Uh, again, it's, uh, uh, you know, everybody's capped for meetings and because those are, there's a strict legal process, oftentimes we're tapped to sit in for an administrator uh, because they're, they're spread too thin, taking care of all the other things they need to take care of. So again, that's, you know, a, a, a time eater in, in some cases. And the, the SART process, which is the school attendance review team. So those are meetings for students who are defined as habitual truants. And then the SARB is the school attendance review board. And if students continue to be truant, they have to go to the SARB board and uh, explain why they're not attending school. <laughs> or try to explain. Um, and then also, we prepare and do all the referrals for, for the transition team, which is a district committee that has administrative representatives from all the secondary sites. And when a student wants to go from one school site to another, uh, we prepare a referral packet uh, based on the student's request to, if they want to go to an alt ed site or they want to go from one comprehensive high school to the other. And then that committee reviews that request and makes a decision based on uh, the criteria that they feel like for that. Great. Um, so this is just a snapshot of some numbers of mental health from this last year. So Nikki Jackson and Linda Walsh, who are district um, guidance counselors, I think you guys probably know them. So they oversee each a variety of different sites. So they had each prepared just from this last year the number of students that were being seen, the number of sessions, the number of CPS reports, and the number of suicide assessments. Um, and while this is great data, what it doesn't account for is the school counselors. We also are doing just as much, if not more, of this on a regular basis. I mean, in one week at Petaluma High a few weeks ago, we had two 5150s in a week, just to you know, put it in perspective. Um, there, and it, you know, there's also a growing number of students that have IEPs, and it's written into their IEP that they need to have mental health um, counseling provided. And um, there's been a, a push for more like school psychs to come on and help with that. And this year, I looked it up today at Petaluma High. We only have one part-time MFT, and she's you know working on her hours, and she's only part-time, and so she meets with 14 students, and we have a school of 1,400 students. So that's you know only accounting for a portion of the students that need more intensive services than you know frankly we have the time or the skill set to offer so that does take a big portion of the jobs this better our job especially when kids feel really connected to us and it's easier for them to come into our office and see us then to go seek outside help and you know start a new connection What's a suicide assessment? So if a student if a student directly reports to us or to a friend or now there's a recently there's been a way through like uh, the district search to see when a student's looking up suicide, mm -hmm. um, we conduct a suicide assessment where we bring them in. There's a whole form and a series of questions that we're trained to ask them to determine, you know, is this an actual threat? Are they actually in danger of harming themselves or is this just a you know, is there other stuff going on? So Typically what we'll do is, uh, for example, a, a student will write something in their journal writing in English that it is dark or threatening or whatever, and the teacher will contact us, and then we'll do that initial assessment, and if it looks like there's there's some, you know, writ, inherent risk there, then we would typically refer it to one of our district uh, mental health professionals, and then they would do an additional assessment and then, you know, refer out as needed. Thank you. Just to give you an idea, I'm talking about the Section 504 plan. So in, in 2010, Petaluma High had 10 of them, 10 students with 504 plans. The whole high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 52 at CASA uh, for, for a larger school. But then uh, fast forward to this year, actually these numbers are old since we did this slide a couple weeks ago. I think we're both probably over 100 now. So. So each student who has one of these plans, that's usually at least two meetings, if not more, an initial meeting, a student study team meeting, and then a subsequent meeting to develop the accommodations in the 504 plan. Plus and again, that's review. bringing in some teachers, psychologists, so it's a lot of resources. Again, we, we, we want and need to provide the, the support, but it's, it's when you look at this, it's striking in the sense that 
we're the same folks, but we have a lot more students who are who are needing these additional supports. So I was just wondering, so the counseling staff are the ones that kind of manage and monitor the 504s, but not the IEPs, right? Because it's the Correct. special ed teacher that's assigned the case manager. So you basically are the case manager. Yes, for exactly. Other yeah. yeah, so then we're all the 504s. Yes. There's an annual meeting for a Yeah, so you have to manage IEPs. all of that along with all the paperwork. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and the data entry into Aries and all the other things that come along with it. And I've got some accommodations for SAT, ACT, and then passing their accommodations along from senior year to college. So, start to finish. Yeah. Um, and then master special challenges. Just so Brett and I both work really closely with our site administrators on the on building the master schedule as well as for you know the counseling team once we've um, you know gotten a sense of our numbers um, and there's some of the challenges that come along with it like Brett alluded to. There are more and more students choosing to take classes elsewhere, which is great, but at the same time it just adds to the like. Oh well, you know Johnny's taking this class here, but also needs to have these periods off so that he can get to his class at whatever school um, online programs. So we have to continuously be aware of you know what online programs are out there. When we both sites offer online credit recovery, but then students also do often take online classes outside of us. So we're always working with the students to make sure they're accredited, are they A to G approved, are they NCAA approved, um, and helping students come up with recovery plans when they fall behind, whether it's Fs and they're not a charge of graduate or Ds if they need to prepare for college. And then at both sites, we've had a continuous um, growth in our ELD population, in particular newcomers, and trying to get creative with scheduling them with not the most um, ELD, ELD supported classes. I mean, we have ELD classes at both schools, but we don't have a lot of other support outside of that. So that's been a big challenge this year and in the last couple of years. And then, you know, just getting creative with how we schedule certain students into particular classes. And then enrollment between schools, trying to, you know, make sure the student wants to take a class across town that we're building a schedule to accommodate that um, on either campus. Just a couple things on the newcomers, Casa Grande, probably both sites, but we've had a real uptick in uh, our newcomer population, which are students who have, have just arrived in the United States, uh, mostly from Central American countries, but not exclusively, and usually monolingual Spanish. And we've averaged probably about one new student a week since school started. And so it's, it's a, with the scheduling and, and um, it's like, here, would you like to take six Spanish classes? You know, it gets a little tricky um, <laughs> setting up the schedule for them. We do have some bilingual instructional aids, but not near enough to, to fan out over all the different subjects. So that's been a challenge. Uh, we do have a, a bilingual therapist who is part of the side-by-side -side nonprofit. She's spent some time at both high school sites to provide mental health services, because what we've also realized is that students uh, have some of the highest mental health illness. We have students at both sites that have been in detention centers and family separation and, and everything else they hear about on the days that are in our, in our schools right now. So it's nice for them to have a Spanish speaking therapist and be able to uh, process with those things. And that, she goes between, or goes between both schools? Yeah, just she's, one day a week. And, yeah, she's like four hours a week at Paloma High. And, yeah, so and very limited, but, limited, but yeah. we'll take it. Uh, so this is a slide, we have a slide for Casa Grande and also for Petaluma right after this. So dual enrollment, so these are the numbers of students who are, who are taking a Santa Rosa Junior College course concurrently while they're in high school. And so this, no, this number represents the summer term, which just ended, and the fall term right now. So 84 students at Casa Grande either took a class last summer or they're, they're taking one right now. And that number, it goes up and down. It was low a few years ago when there were a lot of cuts in the JC and it was just really hard for high school students to even get in classes because they were the bottom of the, the, the order for, for registration. Uh, a couple of comments about this, it, it's interesting. Uh, in, there's a lot of different opinions about whether this is a good idea or a bad idea when you're looking at staffing and master schedules. Um, there's a lot of different stories in these numbers. Um, some of these students are taking classes at the JC instead of at the high school. So maybe they're taking history there and taking an elective instead of the high school. 
Some of these students are also students who are in, in specialized programs that they get involved in. There's a Summer Health Careers Academy at the JC. Uh, we have students that enroll in the work experience class at the JC. Now you know yes. about that one. Um, <laughs> uh, and get credit for working. So although it, they look high in some cases, it's a lot of students that are doing uh, a lot of different types of things that happen to be under the umbrella of concurrent enrollment at the JC. And for the next one, so Petaluma High School. Pretty, uh, just pretty similar numbers and I mean we spend a lot of our time not just working with our seniors getting ready for the JC but students throughout that decide they want to take whatever class and walking them through that process and even though you know we do put it back on the student ultimately as counselors we're nice people we want to help everyone so <laughs> we um, end up you know doing a lot of hand holding to help get these students enrolled in the right classes. So um, our, oh. Oh. <laughs> our staffing so uh, 2007 and 2008 from my, my research with the HR folks and also my, my institutional memory here with our, our high point with counselor staffing at the secondary level, we had 16.6 FTE. In fairness, there was a, a grant that Governor Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger signed into law that went away and they hired some new counselors and then the money disappeared a couple years later. So uh, there was those, I think we lost a couple positions when that money went away, but um, it was good. Well, it lasted. Uh, so fast forwarding now, uh, we have um, 13 full-time counselors between all the comprehensive sites. Um, the, the, the real tricky one, uh, Sherry's position now where uh, we have a counselor who's half-time at the junior high uh, or a third time at, at Petaluma Junior and then also serving students at continuation and also students at our Valley Oaks Independent Study, which are completely different populations of students with completely different needs and uh, probably putting a lot of miles on our car going back and forth. Uh, so it, it really, um, given some of the new challenges that we face, um, are we adequately staffed? Uh, you know, we do our best. We, we try to serve all the students the best we can, but it, it really, um, we were able to do a lot more in terms of individualized activities when, when staffing was at a higher level. Uh, a lot of our activities, as you can see, our, our group presentations and classes, their evening events, you know, we try to reach students in mass because we, we don't have that time to sit down all the time one on one like we'd like to. Um, and then this just breaks down each school what the numbers were as of a few days ago at each site and the number of counselors. So roughly um, each counselor has a case of anywhere from 300 to 400 plus students. Um, ASCA recommends that there's one counselor for every 250 students. So just like Brett said, you know, some of the things that we'd like to be doing, we don't really get to do either at all or in a most effective way. I mean, sometimes I, you know, spend five minutes with a student and I hope that they grasp all the information I tell them in five minutes or less because that's the time that I have with them. So, you know, we, again, I mean, I think of both sites, all of our sites do a really great job and we have wonderful counselors across the board. But, um, you know, sometimes when parents or people in the community ask, well, why aren't you doing more of this? This kind of shows where our you know, challenges lie. And then we just wanted to kind of summarize this real briefly, the College and Career Center, because we work super closely with them, Chris at Pablo Mahai and Valerie at CASA. Um, they help on both the college and career side. Uh, Chris has spent countless number of hours already this semester working one-on-one -on -one with our seniors, start to finish with their college applications. Um, she'll spend an hour with each student or more and help them kind of you know, get through everything they need. She sets up all of our college visits and fairs. She um, attends our evening events that we do. Um, she helps with appeals when students get denied from schools that they apply to. She also helps really closely with all the financial aid from helping students apply, which both sites offer um, financial aid weeks in the fall, to then working with students to understand, well, what does this mean when it says X amount of money in loans? And then similarly, Valerie's doing the same and all the career stuff, which yeah, yeah, so on the career side, uh, the, the College and Career Center staff support us and in some cases with our in-class presentations in terms of sometimes we'll divide it up and, and they'll actually do some of those presentations so we can hit more students in, in one swoop. 
uh, also working with all of the uh, college uh, visits, military recruiters, a lot of the outside programs. There's a tremendous amount of, of interest that comes in where, where outside agencies want students to do something, a job shadow, a summer program. And so they really do triage to try to organize all of that and, and get information to the students who could best benefit from those, those programs. And then, of course, um, issuing work permits is a big is a big part of their job as well, and, and tracking those students to make sure they're abiding by the policies of their work permits. And with even fewer hours to do it all, Chris is on our site 40 weeks at 25 hours, and Val is what does most for hours of cost, but also does in time at Sonoma Mountain and Carpe Diem. Okay. All right. So we are happy to answer any questions. We also put together just some packets about with some basic information from ASCA as well as specific by site. Um, Brett's uh, has from Casa Grande, the course catalog, which really goes into detail, and there's a puddle in Mahai, just a list of the calendar of activities and different things that we try to do year by year to help make sure we're serving all of our students in this district. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Monday through Thursday and she works with 14 students and then Brett had alluded to that we have a Spanish speaking counselor that was provided through side by side and she's on our site for four hours a week and it costs a yeah, so we have yeah. so do we not a intern? What's that? Do you share the intern? No, so our intern, intern is, uh, the intern that we have is just at our site, and then Nikki Jackson oversees her, and I don't know, what, do you know Linda what? Walsh Linda Walsh. Linda Walsh, yeah. yeah. So, so each site, it's depending on how many interns we can get, because there's a lot of competition yeah. for the yeah. interns, um, so there's a lot of paid positions for them now. Uh, and there, there's typically part-time, so right now at Casa Grande we have two, Part-time interns, I would say they're roughly about 15 to 20 hours a week. And then Linda Walsh, who coordinates them, also spends one day a week on campus. So uh, there's probably about 45 slots or so, give or take, there for, for students. Uh, they Some students, if they're really high risk, they'll see them weekly. Some of them are monthly check-ins. Some of them will just do an introduction and here's another trusted adult you can talk to if, if things you know get out of hand or whatever. So we, we try to uh, use those services, but also sparingly, because um, you know we we get to this point where they're all booked up, and then we've got someone you know crying and falling apart in our office, and we're thinking, oh, we'll get you in in two weeks. You know, so we don't want to have that situation, but uh, they do get booked up. Appointments. So side by side is formerly Seneca, right? Sunny Hills. Sunny Hills. 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 Yeah. Too many guests, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what type of PD do you guys feel like you need? I know there's a lot of teachers. Um, so one of the things we've been asking for is training for 504 plans since that's become uh, a larger and larger part of our job and it's there are so many legal uh, ramifications and, and especially if you're trying to exit a student from their 504 plan oftentimes uh, parents and others aren't necessarily happy with that and, yeah. and so we need to know what the uh, you know, we, we have a general idea, but it, it's it's becoming, you know, just like special ed, more litigious, and, and uh, yeah. so Better to find out before a lawsuit. Yes, <laughs> yes. Training is much cheaper than yes. yeah. yeah. services. Absolutely. And I went to ASCA this summer, which was a three-day conference, um, just really to seek out, like, how are counselors around this country dealing with issues? Because I know we're not alone. Like, I have counselor friends all over, and, you know, the mental health, issues are real and the challenges to get students into college and everything in between and so um, I went to so many different sessions but I went to some that were geared on like what kind of, I'm not saying we should be fully focused on mental health but there it is a huge reality right around here so and in all areas so what can like be done at a district level as that then can be shadowed back into school sites that like can better support all these students like you know are should we be doing more like 
I don't know, mental health wellness assemblies, like bringing in outside people, people just, you know, and be more proactive rather than reactive. Because what I fear is that I don't want it to one day come to something really tragic happening in this community to take it. Oh, wait, we should be focused more on this. So, so do you feel like mental health, like workshops for teachers, for counselors, for students, just in general? Yeah, certainly the mental health and also uh, the, there's the California Career Guidance Initiative, which is something that if we have the time and the resources, that's a, a, a state program that partners with districts that allows students to start at the ninth grade level and build an online database that is college and career, and it's a kind of a clearinghouse of all kinds of information, and then at the capstone of the senior year, it'll actually load that information right into their college, their CSU college application. And you see that. And so, you know, that's something that we hear about little tidbits about it every year, but it's something much bigger than us in, in terms of it's more of a district level uh, initiative, and I'm sure there's money involved in training and, and partnerships and all that. But um, something that, you know, that both, you know, high school, really all of our high schools, the all dead if we had a, some kind of a platform like that where we could say, you know, okay, we're all part of this, and, and that if a student goes from site to site, that account can fall. What's the platform? California Colleges. Yeah, so californiacolleges.edu is the website, and then it's the California Career Guidance Initiative is the, the thing for that. So yeah, they have free the services, money. but then they have district-based services as well. That, you know, an algebra idea, yeah. So I don't know, but some days I'm like, is the mental health a bigger part of my job, or is the college getting kids into college, and, or are they all linked together, right? I mean, you know. What about the ELD support? Yeah, I mean that you know that that's really more of a um, you know I, I would say on the on the classroom side, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's really been um, you know in all fairness, I mean with some of these students they come in and I, I work with one of our bilingual instructional aides and we build a schedule and I'm just thinking, oh my God, you know I'm putting you in this biology class and you don't speak English and you're supposed to learn Latin terms, you know just. <laughs> Um, and there may or may not be a translator or a bilingual assistant in there. And, and so it looks like we're going to have this continuous flow. Our, our newcomers class, ELD class, the, the beginning level, historically has been about 12 students, yeah. you know, sometimes a little lower. And we're up to 24, 25. Oh, 24 so, in the newcomers? Yeah, so, you know, we have one teacher and an aide with, with all Spanish, primarily Spanish speaking students, and then of course then they have to fan out into the mainstream. And so that's that's an area where I think school wide, not necessarily just counseling, but um, yeah. it, it's you know, we're really just kind of try to be as creative as we can, but uh, it's a lot of you know, like that ELD newcomer class, that's a lot of students for one teacher. Yeah. And I put all my it's combined, it's ELD ones and twos, yeah, so it's newcomers two. combined with the other ones, and then the ELD threes are in a separate one. But um, I put my outside of ELD and then the Spanish for Native Speakers class, there's not really like we're just like survive if we put you guys together you can all learn off of each other and that it's really hard I mean it's I feel bad when I hand them their schedules but luck out there yeah so this might be getting into the weeds a little bit but um, you know they used to have the uh, ELD four, and that they they were the support class for the college prep English and so I was just wondering I, is the ELD four support class no longer there? No, we have it. It's 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 a different number, it's but different we still number. have. So that's the students that are are they're at the highest level. They're at the highest level, still, but they're yeah, not quite proficient yet. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So yeah, both sites have at Pablo Mahias. There's an ELD one two class, right. and then it's the same teacher on the next day that's also doing more of that. And then the higher level ELD threes are then in a regular college so prep English. And now they have a college prep English for the three. Yes, exactly. And then do they also have a support class? Not, no, not unless they have an IEP. Yeah. So they're just they're an ELD three. They have ELD. So there's ELD two levels of pure ELD. And then they have the English class. Yeah. yeah. So it's, and again, you have so a variety of levels, numbers. and some students who have been educated in their home country, some who have not. And so it's a, what an interesting group. <laughs> um, 
But I will say this, it's a good investment because historically when you look at our standardized test scores, our, the students on the other end who are redesignated English fluent who have gone through the program often score as high or outperform some of their peers who have been educated from kindergarten in English. So, um, you know, we really try to grab them when they're young, so to speak, uh, but it, it's tough when you show up when you're 16 and in a new country and everything. So that's certainly an area of need in both sides is support for that population. What about translations or anything? Like you talked about five or four plans and you're sitting in IEPs. Are these things being translated on paper for parents or is it just out loud? Um, mainly. Mostly just out loud. Yeah. 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 So, like Pablo Maya, we have like one and a half. We have one full, well, she, yeah, she's full time, and then one who's with us in the mornings and then it costs them afternoons. And so we rely on those two to, you know, be in with us in meetings for translations. And sometimes we get them to type up the notes afterwards, but I mean, they're also across for time. So, and they also work, like at Pablo Maya, they work a lot with our ELT students during the breaks and like A plus time to try to help them out. So I'd rather have them spend their time doing that. During I'm sure it's an issue, right? You have right. someone who's new to the country who comes to you for crisis support. I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. Right, right. And and the the reality is you, you have the students, their their educational levels, even in their home language, is so there are so many variants there that it, and when we have a, uh, one of our bilingual assistants come to translate at an IEP or a Bible four meeting or a parent meeting, we're pulling them out of a classroom that they were supporting the students in. So it, it's kind of a one-two punch and okay, we need to steal you, but you guys just sort of hang out. And so it's it's been tricky. Definitely. Is Spanish the only second language? Um, no, it's by far the, the, the primary right. one, but we do get some uh, students from Javi, uh, Occasionally Chinese, but primarily Spanish. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we are going on to public comment, which interestingly enough is all about counseling. <laughs> I need to read this really quick, oh, but sure. you're the first one. So, <laughs> under government code section 549543, five, members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any item of interest providing it relates to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district. In accordance with board policy, each speaker is allocated a total of four minutes to address the board for a maximum of 20 minutes on each subject matter. While the above reference government codes allow speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, programs, services, and their employees, the district does have a current policy specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. The board does not take action or discuss items not appearing on the agenda. The board values public comments and wishes to convey that although board members cannot discuss items that are not on the agenda, they listen carefully and appropriate and appreciate and value to the public and we take notes. So. Uh, hello. I'm Kylie Chikini Haynes, and um, I've come here with a, a few of my students from San Antonio High School that I think a couple of them are going to be speaking in a, in a few <laughs> minutes. Um, just a little bit about me and, and why I'm here. Um, I taught at Petaluma High School for 24 years as an English teacher, and then six years ago I decided I wanted to do something different, and I've always loved working with at-risk students, so I went over to San Antonio High School, and I've been there now. This is my sixth year. And so being in the district for 30 years now, this year, um, this is the second time, only the second time I've come and talked in front of the board. Um, so to me, it, it's got to be something really important. And for me, this really is. And it's the situation of our lack of sufficient guidance counseling support. Um, last year, uh, well, at the beginning of this year, I should say, this academic school year, we found out we weren't going to have our guidance counselor come back with us. And so we were thinking, okay, we'll, we'll find somebody, a full-time counselor. We, we had a quote-unquote full-time counselor last year. 
Um, we sh I say full time because he sh we shared with a Valley Oak, so it was half Petaluma, uh, half San Antonio High School and half Valley Oaks. Um, the district then decided that no, we were actually only going to have a half, a .5 counselor that we would share with Valley Oaks. So the, the slide that um, the counselors shared with you was not quite right, that uh, we're at a .25, we share with Valley Oaks a .25. And I know you all have been to our beautiful little campus and um, you understand the vulnerability of our student population, how at risk a lot of these kids are, um, and how much they need the guidance counseling, let alone as they were, uh, the, the counselors were talking about the mental health counseling, which we've also lost some this year. We don't have um, our uh, mental health counselor the same number of hours as we did. So um, we, I've got a couple students who are going to be talking about how it impacts that how it has impacted them specifically not having a guidance counselor, but Mondays and Fridays. That's all they get, and that um, and Sherry Lee has done a fabulous job, but she's also trying to serve um, the junior high as well. Um, our students don't have as many of these beautiful kids that were out here today. They don't have the kind of family support that's there. Their parents are not comfortable with the language, might not even be literate. So things like filling out a FAFSA or helping support their student get into Santa Rosa Junior College, they're not, they're not comfortable with that. So our guidance counselor is really needed for that, as well as helping dreamers and, um, and some of the career college counseling that, that was alluded to. We don't really have that, and, and that's one piece that I think as we look at, um, with our TOSAs, um, why San Antonio has a graduation rate situation, a problem that we need to work on, connecting those students with life out of high school, not necessarily JC even, but um, trade schools and job shadows, and to give them a vision of what it looks like to be an adult and um, in a career job. So um, we're just asking that the board look at um, the funding for this. We are begging <laughs> for uh, at least our counseling uh, to be put back to the level that it was. And we know at San Antonio High School, we're only going to get more students as the year progresses, right? That's just sort of who we are as, the, as students leave the big schools, they come to us. So um, Sherry's only going to be seeing more and more students. All right, thank you. Wait, Kylie, I yes. have a, a, a clarification question. You talked about guidance counselor and mental health counselor. Do you have both? We or do. Or is your guidance counselor doing the mental health? We have both. And okay. so, yes, we have both. Um, and, and what's both the percentage that? for the mental health counselor? How? 60%. 60%? Okay, thanks. Thank you. And, and I, this is an agendized item, so we can, we can chat, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and just any clarification on this language, if you're talking about guidance counselors, where I was talking about school counselors, is there a difference or is it the same thing? No. So, a guidance counselor is kind of an old school term. Um, it got morphed about like 20 years ago to school counseling. So, it is the same thing, but school counselor is kind of the updated, you know, new and improved lingo. Okay. Yeah, more comprehensive than okay. that. Okay, thank you. about what Chikini was going to talk about, just add on to it. So one of my, I guess one of my things that I had to go through with uh, Sherry Lee is that like right now I'm looking into going into junior college and it's very hard because I don't have, like Chikini said, I don't have the support that my family wants to give. They, they've they never been to college, you know, my older brother, he went to college, he didn't understand most of it. You know, we had our old counselor, which he, he also um, helped my older brother, the, the last counselor that we had at San Antonio. And, you know, he just kind of mixed in, like confused a lot of things about junior college and how to apply to that. 
And so now that I only have, uh, what is it, like a quarter of a guidance counselor at San Antonio is even tougher for me because now I'm like 18 credits away from graduating. And so I just have to like, have to focus on applying to the JC, but it's very hard when I don't have the, the support that I need from my family and like not the counselors as well, because it's very hard. She's doing a great job. Don't get me wrong, she's doing a great job. She has helped me get the classes that I needed, but it's really hard when, you know, you only have a quarter of a counselor there to help you, you know, like apply to uh, junior colleges or look at scholarships or, you know, find careers, you know, like in, in that subject, in those topics. So it's really, it's really, I just, I just, I'm, I'm just really concerned about the kids there now that uh, need maybe like 100 credits, you know, they're seniors and, you know, they need 100 credits to finish up and, you know, they only have a quarter of a counselor there, you know, to help them out and get the, get the credits that they need. So that's, that's one of my concerns and my concern myself, like that's a really big thing for me. I just, I love seeing the kids, you know, grow and like get their uh, credits done, you know. I, I heard, um, I think it was like a month ago that, you know, one kid got really concerned about not getting the credits that he needs and graduating on time because of like having a quarter of a counselor there. You know, um, it was on a Wednesday, I think, and you know, she, uh, we didn't have Miss Lee at, you know, uh, San Antonio. And he was just very frustrated over it, um, getting really, you know, he wasn't, he was just not doing his work because he felt like he couldn't finish high school because of like not having a uh, guidance counselor there and helping him out and figuring out how many credits uh, he needed. I sat down with him personally and I help, I try to help him and guide him to the right direction and what classes he needed to take and what classes that, you know, um, he should be taking in the future uh, to finish up high school. So that's just one of my concerns about not having, you know, a full-time guidance counselor at my school. Um, you know, it's not more on me, it's more on the kids that are going there right now because, you know, they're going to be there for a while, you know, like for the whole school year. And I just, I, I really wanted to see them progress and, you know, be bright in their academics and just, you know, have the career that they want because I look at, like, what I want and it's, it's hard, like, it's, it's, it's just, it's hard, but I, I have, I have the willpower to do it, but, you know, like some of these kids just need that extra push to, uh, to have that, you know, tunnel vision. So that's just one of the things that I'm saying. Thank you. Thanks. so I understood it then too because I had really bad mental health issues at the time when I was at CASA so like my grades were like plummeting down because I experienced a huge thing outside of school and it was like since we didn't have a sufficient amount of counselors it was super hard for me to get the support that I needed and that's why I chose to go to San Antonio because it's a smaller school and I was like oh it'll be easier for me to manage my emotions and all those different things but I still have some of those issues and it's kind of not, it kind of feels like it's repeating again and I haven't will the motivation to move forward in my education rather than like go to people for support to motivate me and to help me guide through everything. It's like I have to become my own guidance counselor a little bit even though I'm not trying to discredit her for all the effort that she puts in because it really does make a difference the effort that she puts in. But it's just like it's not enough because she's not there enough. So I think that it's really important that we have these guidance counselors there in order to make students feel motivated and able to finish school. Otherwise, they tend to lose motivation and they just don't see a point in continuing their education. So I feel like if we really want to help improve like students doing better in life and just school all around, we really do need the good guidance counselor support. And that's kind of like all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. JC does a lot of, you know, uh, work with the, with the kids at CASA and at Petaluma High. Do they do the same thing at San Antonio? Not to the same extent, but yes, we have 
So did they come in and they work with the students in terms of how they might be able to? Well, for the first time this year, we have someone coming in a couple of Wednesdays to work with our students um, for 50 minutes. And what's the difference with how much they spend time at the comprehensive high schools? So, I mean, at both comprehensive high schools, they come in and we have a bunch of special sessions throughout the year. And they wouldn't be able to do that work without partner support. So, the counselors at the school were recruiting the students to sign up to go to the workshops. We're writing the classes to get them out of class. We're following up. We're sending them text messages, reminding them to come to their sessions. We're, you know, doing a lot of hand holding from start to finish, making sure they're getting their concurrent enrollment forms. And following up, we use, and we think we have interns that will have or sometimes follow up with some of our students that haven't yet turned in those forms. Um, and we're able to done because like we have our four counselors plus we have a part-time intern to support us and it's still an overwhelming amount of work and I think probably the same yeah. is true of Costa. But the support that JC gives us is really driven by the counselors at each site and so they're not really actively seeking us out we're saying here's what we need and they're coming in to support yeah i guess i guess i was just wondering if maybe there could be some kind of collaboration with the teeth with the the kids at san antonio and somehow you know a lot get them to be able to take advantage even if it's at casa or is at petaluma the, but i don't know it may be way too much i don't know i was well, just wondering one of the struggles is, is that the jc their their staffing just like ours it ebbs and flows mm -hmm. and you know well i'm not and, saying more yeah. i'm saying with and that and yeah, we right? do we do um, promote the activities that happen at Casa and at Petaluma uh -huh. High School yeah. to our students to um, encourage yeah. them to attend some of the events that occur at these at the uh, comprehensive sites. Honestly, do they go? I, well, yeah. honestly, I don't have enough time. Yeah, right. No, I understand. Not, it I don't want to put any more work on you guys. I'm just traffic. trying to figure out how I this might. One of the issues too is that the JC, they are the JC, so it's not their product. And the students, we want to market a variety of different options, and especially at the all head sites where they're really looking at a lot more apprenticeship, trade, directly right. into the work world. And so the J, you know, it's like going to a Honda dealer and asking about Toyotas. You know, it's um, we're generalists. So we can provide information on all of those different areas where the JC they can come in and say this is what we have and but and that's you know that's the extent of, of their offering. So it wouldn't be any help. You know, the, the kids don't really go. I mean, I've announced it on the announcements. I have a paper that. Um, I announced that there was a, an evening at Petaluma High, and I don't think we got any kids of our kids to go. They need a little bit more hand holding than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, yeah. So okay. they need it at the site, not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they don't necessarily have the transportation yes. or the family support to get over there. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. Mm -hmm. Report on activities and correspondence of school board. We were busy. We had an administrative get together, a PD day at Casa, district. What? Oh no! Well, I we took one. I'll just look, wait. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Activities, administrative get together, PD Day at Casa Grande, district discussion on discipline for secondary teachers, SCO legislators luncheon, Petaluma High School American Government class, no guns here, no gas here, excuse me, court hearing, and there is the gas station's on hold at this moment, isn't it? FFA barbecue and Tide workshop. Okay, uh, next, approval of consent agenda, and there's only two things on there. I move to accept the, um, approve the consent agenda. Second. Questions, comments? 
All in favor? Aye. Action items. Okay, we have the amended certificated employees auxiliary salary schedule. Did everybody get a chance to look at that? Comments? We questions? Should we move it? Just I'll oh, move it. Move, um, move to approve or accept or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Do I second? I seconded. Okay. Comments, questions? I just need an explanation. Yeah, sure. I'm not, I'm not, what is the home and hospital so teachers? The, what are uh, home and hospital teachers? Home and hospital teachers are, are teachers that um, go directly to kids who can't get to school for whatever reason. They have a broken leg and they're at home, they have pneumonia, they have some yeah. mental issues, and so there's someone that short goes. Short-term assignment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Short-term assignment, bro you know, broke my leg, I need a, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't access school, I need to have a, someone come and work with me at my home. Mm -hmm. Typically go out for an hour, hour a day to work with the student. And this is a, um, we, we sat down with PFT Adult Ed during our, our most recent negotiations, and um, one of the things that came out of the, out of that was this there was some home and hospital language as well they were on on with, with the adult ed and it didn't really fit with that group and so now it's going on it's more of a summer school it was it felt more like the auxiliary schedule where it belonged mm -hmm, yeah. and so we we both agreed and we, we removed it from the adult ed contract oh. and put it onto the certificated auxiliary salary schedule cool makes sense to me is everybody, is everybody clear about what home hospital is? Any other comments, questions about that? About some of the positions or anything like that? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Student services approval of application for the name change from Crossroads to Rides. I'm going to approve. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Do you have a second? Second. Comments? Questions? Yes. I Yay. think it's great. <laughs> All in favor? Obviously. Aye. 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 Good. I thought we already. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, now it's official. Yeah. Um, all right. We're on discussion information only. District goals 2019. Yes. Yeah, so we've been working, working on these since our board retreat way back in no it was March March yeah. in March and um, you know we identified some areas that we really wanted to do a deeper dive into um, there have been things that have happened in the community and outside of the community that have accelerated some of these or at least made them if, if for no other reason I think it was a general sense that we were we, we had our finger on the pulse Mm -hmm. of some of these issues and so um, you know we need to formalize um, them as, as goals and initiatives and they may end up being in reality some of these are probably multi-year types of goals uh, such as the first one um, and so do you um, Ashley do you did you get my email yes Okay, if you go. Yeah, pull that up and just put it on the screen, that's fine. Um, so the first one was um, developing a multi-year professional development plan to provide equity, diversity, and inclusivity training to district employees. And emphasis on multi-year <laughs> on that. Um, and that process is starting so we met with EERC was the start of that process and we were able to talk with that group about a, a way to roll out that plan and so the next step in the process is we reached out to four different organizations that we know have worked in the Bay Area have, have kind of proven strategies around working with school districts and education and teacher training and as well as um, a background in human resource function so that we can also look at that goal of recruiting and retaining uh, more diverse staff all around both certificated and looking at classified as well and um, in, in within the HR realm to meet that goal as well so on November 1st we uh, I, with the help of Loretta and with Sandra put together a panel that's going to have two students one from Sonoma Mountain one from Casa Grande one parent, who's a Petaluma High parent, uh, Matthew will be there to represent the human resource angle, and I'll be there for the district equity goal work. 
Um, and then we have Ani Larson is going to sit on that committee as well as one of our site uh, administrators from the elementary and middle school level. Um, and then again, two certificated members, Sandra and Erin, actually, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and two classified members, Sylvia and Audrey, are going to be there. So on November 1st, we have four organizations coming to present to us. And what are those organizations? Those are the Pacific Educational Group and a Courageous Conversations oh, okay. Pacific Educational Group, Circle Up Education, EPOC, E P O C H, is all capitalized. And seeds of awareness. So, and they're all you. You can look up all. They're all great groups. What Local time? groups have done a lot of work with schools in the area. It's all day. Oh, well, it's all day long. Yes. And so, if any of you would like to come sit on this as well, we're starting at 8:45 a.m. for the setup to kind of talk about because this group hasn't met before. Um, so you'll be there for the whole thing. Is to do set up the HR piece of it, to set up the general training and equity piece of it. Um, and then we have our first group coming at 10, and then they're here all day, and our final debrief of the day will end at 4 p.m. So the, the, um, the crux of the, the, obviously the crux of this issue is, you know, what does our role, what, is, what role do we play with our, with our students, with our staff, um, in helping to address some real societal issues that are facing this country and, and this community. And um, we, we're looking at putting together this process, hopefully getting some direction. It's less, I think, more than about who's presenting and more about what we're covering yeah. and how are we building a, a, a sustainable model. So, um, it'll... Is this going to be an ongoing group? Or is it just that We're just meeting to meet with those groups so that we can discuss as a committee which one is best aligned with our human resources vision, okay. with our diversity and equity vision, and, and with the way that we want to roll out the training. From sure. there, once we've talked and can then select an organization or, or do consults on an organization, we're hoping that we can start some work with the organization that gets selected in January or beginning of next semester sometime. Okay, so great. The group won't meet again. It's just a, a group to select. Right. Okay. okay. The, okay. the organization. And where is it? We're going to be in the Petaluma Conference Room front on November front 1st. Front. The front? Yeah, right up here in the front, November 1st, starting at 8.45 a.m. The second um, goal initiative is is developing a plan to implement steps to increase hiring diversity. And um, I couldn't help but think that uh, during the last presentation yeah. that two things. One is um, we really need to support the full and fair funding initiative. Yeah. And when and I'm just going to stay with the positive. When that goes through, yeah. <laughs> That counseling support is definitely somewhere high on that list because it's, there's no doubt, there's no one that's that's working with kids that would dispute that we're facing more issues now than we've faced yeah. ever. That that's clear, but well, it, that, they know about and that's across the board. But I think the second part of that is, you know, do we have um, Spanish-speaking representation? Right. Yeah. You know, I don't know. You know. There's, there's an access issue piece. You could have 100, 100 counselors, but if you, don't have, if you don't have some authentic access, there's some issues. So that's part of the reason why I think this is an important uh, goal and initiative and why the board brought it up, because we, we have to do a little bit more to make that effort. We may not, in the first year, um, you know, hit that diversity goal, we have to make a greater effort. We have to throw the net a little bit wider and a little bit deeper to see if we can bring bring in more diversity. Um, we were able to do that administratively this last year, but can we continue that? It would be interesting to also look at who's leaving and why they're leaving. Um, so if it's mostly teachers of color and staff of color that are mm -hmm. leaving, what is that? Some exit. Yeah. Yep. The, the third area is um, We've talked a lot about as well, and it was a big discussion at the at the session in, in August. Is just trying to streamline streamlining student access to, to our our own coursework. We have a we have one third of one percent of our students that have an opportunity to cross 
to their sister school. Um, and yet, the requirements now for the state on um, expanding our college and career readiness numbers really necessitates us giving us kids options to be able to take college and career readiness courses, CTE courses at, at their schools, the schools that they, they um, have an interest in. Well, it seems like it also dovetails into the counseling mm -hmm. you know, presentation and their need for, you know, I mean, they have the college and career um, counselors, but also just, you know, the amount that's on their plate. So it's a, so it's, they said, yeah. they say that was one of their, um, the career guidance initiative, that was one of the things that they wanted to work into. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've already been working on this. So there's a, a small group with Megan and Brett and Ashley and I and Gary. We've met a few times to identify what are the courses that are unique to right. each of the two high schools. And we're creating a pamphlet that can go out to kids. We're trying to, we're, we're trying to cram it in to get it out by the time the eighth graders come and do the tours. Cool. So we'll, so see, we'll see if we make it, but that's the goal. Um, so so, that, so, so what that. courses are unique? And then of the courses that each school ha has, which which of those are CTE, okay. yeah. and then the CTE pathways, what they are. So it's it's kind of a multi-purpose document, but um, we've been working with counselors already on putting that together. So, okay. cool. fourth area is um, exploring district revenue generation opportunities. And uh, I have a question going back to oh, yeah, the first, first and the second. So you have this panel. So is there a representation on the panel? Like it's a diverse panel for people. Is it all like people be active? Well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking down, student-wise, yes, there are students of color, parents of color, um, and and classified members um, as well. So yes, there there is diverse representation. I'd say about of the one of the ten. Um, like four, one, two, three, four, five, five. I would say five people of color. So, yeah, yeah, 50% of the group. Probably that was a question for all the bridge for the staff. So, the, the, the fourth area is uh, exploring just different ways that we can we can re revenue generate. And actually, revenue generation also, I mean, in, a, in a, the flip side of that, is, is review expense reductions. Yeah. Um, Trying not to impact classroom, um, but and then we think we, there, there might be some opportunities there um, with some uh, some taking back of program from the county oh, from okay. uh, scope. But the the real the real issue of we're 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 the, the cost of you know our parcel tax is largely made up of um, human resource. Most of the funding that goes to that goes to people. And the cost of people when the parcel tax started is very, very different right. than the cost of people today. And so, um, you know, we want to be able to, we have an ad hoc committee right now of two board members that'll be meeting to discuss and look at some options that they'll bring back to the board for further discussion. Um, looking down the road, um, depending on what also happens, of course, what happens with this full and fair funding could be significant. And then the last, the last area was, or at least in the, the fifth area, was improving district-wide communications and doing much more um, thoughtful work um, around with social media, video communications, different engagement events, board office hours, which you've started, and try to, again, I think it's very similar to uh, the second item, cast the net a little bit wider mm -hmm. and try to go to places that we may not have reached before. Um, and our goal is to have tangible evidence in all of these areas that we are, we, we see some really, at the very least, progress moving in all of these areas and hopefully significant progress in some of them. Um, but I know that there, there were some other discussion items that, that this one that came up that was part of the the um, the August meeting you know, that we weren't quite sure what to deal with with it related to the arts. Right. So we're probably going to flesh that out because I think that should be in, in here. Yeah. For goals. Okay. 
so looking at the, the issue was, was about that, that, that resonated with Cliff's group actually was how do we, how do we um, continue to increase the infusion of arts throughout our K-12 program and that the arts program um, is not only going into depth in specific arts but also integrating arts in the curriculum, particularly at K-6, and doing that real integration. How does that relate to, to with, with language arts? How does that relate to social studies, science, PE, and all of that? Some teachers are already doing that, but I don't think it's across the board. So we were going to bring, we'll, we'll look at, um, at adding some type of a goal area about doing some research into that and bringing people together, a committee committees together to look at how, what are ways that we could do that to expand our art outreach. Um, but that's already a lot of a lot of areas, but we think that those can be can be tackled and we can make a determination at the end of the year whether we want to continue and, and take it to the next iteration or not. Um, that's the short and long version. Any other comments or input or thoughts, ideas. Okay, the, you know. well the only other thing <laughs> we have to we stop that long pause. <laughs> you know, I wasn't gonna say it, but I think it's she's <laughs> analytical. I'm, I'm just thinking is it oh it's later than that. I was just um, I think that I don't want to add I think to this. But I would like, I what just found um, uh, notes that I took on goals and objectives and priorities that we did at some point. I don't have a date on it. And um, there were a couple of things about professional development being um, kind of more targeted, teacher driven, more yes. nibble, um, and a commitment to project based learning and student centered classrooms um, that could possibly be part of that. Maybe we just want to look at that next year. But it seems like um, since we just had that big professional development day, which you know seemed really, really good. But I also um, I also heard that it's it's still that same, you know, hour, hour, hour. And I think we looking at all the teacher training demands, it seems like we need to rethink how we deliver teacher training. And maybe um, a little bit more in depth. Yeah, I mean, right there were two, down. I noticed that there were two um, workshops on there that were given by Apple, you know, representatives on iPads. We're no longer, you know, I mean, they have iPads. I still do, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, you know, it seemed the, 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 the thing that I was hearing was from people that, that took David's, you know, that was doing the Chromebook, and it was the how to use a Chromebook really creatively, and they loved it. You know, and it, yeah, it was all good. <laughs> but there's also, you know, if you're talking about professional development, there's also. Sorry, I should have said that at the outset, I'm sorry. <laughs> there's also that whole trauma and ACEs professional right. development. Right, and the resilience training and all of that. Yeah, yeah so. I don't know. That I don't know, that's I don't know whether, whether that would be a district goal to like look at all the different training demands. Or professional, and professional development, development demands, yes. and how can we make it, you know, uh, so that everybody feel each, you know, elementary and high school. Yes. I just want to say, positive thing. I think it's going in the right direction. I appreciate Cliff. For the first time, we have a co-facilitator at PFT that's working to plan staff development. So I'm really hopeful that all those things you're saying are starting to happen. So yeah. Thank you. I did yeah. both of those Apple workshops and it rocked. Oh, good. Using it. You know, it was junior high school using it. And she was able to talk about how you could still use it with your Chromebook. Because eventually yeah, we still have them, yeah. right? Yes. I mean, and there's great. stuff that you can do on those that you can't do on Chrome. So. Especially for art teachers. Yeah, for art. Yeah. And so, a few high school teachers came to me with some concerns, and what I said to him is I think the district is very open to meeting their needs now, which is wonderful, so, but people have to speak up. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I agree. In my opinion, so professional development. I plus right now for effort, and it doesn't, well, work, it doesn't work when it's top down. Yeah. 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 It's got to be. I feel that's changing. It is. So, 
I mean, obviously, board, you can do whatever you want with the goal, but it, this is the first year of this reconstituted PD focus. So the Professional okay. Growth and Learning Committee is 100% focused on PD, um, trying to address these concerns that have popped up over the past few years. Um, one of them being trying to get more staff to respond to the survey. Right. So in the past, we get maybe about half of the right. staff. And so we would base our plans based off of that feedback. Well, there's a whole other half of the staff we didn't hear from. And so if they had, had different thoughts, well, they were never getting addressed. So, um, you know, I, I, would, I would hope that we would give this new committee with their, you know, Well, I'm not saying focus. it was just, they're, they're, just wondering you know, if we wanted shot, to continue but. that as a goal. But I don't know if that's a district. Was it a goal as last a board year? goal? Was that how you did that? Did no, you that, get that, that came out of negotiations. Or just it was part of negotiations. Yeah. Yeah. This is a good goal. Yeah. Well, we don't have to ask. I mean, we have a lot. But you, but because you're already, it's already happening. The, yeah, the committee already has. Well, I think it. I actually think it ties into the the whole piece on improved district-wide communications. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Because it's it, mm -hmm. it, it's you know kind of being thoughtful about going through some of this and making sure that all get a lot of eyes on it. It's slower, mm -hmm. but it's but ultimately it becomes more effective. Yeah. Well, it's not top down. It's what teachers want. They're the ones that have to sit there. It's an easy journey. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, County Committee on School District Organization. Yes. So you are not required to do anything. Okay. Um, I'm just giving you the background. Yeah. And if you choose to not to do anything, um, you would be you would be in fall in line with all the other boards. <laughs> However, if one of you would like to be nominated into the as a representative for the Sonoma County Committee on School District or Organization, we're not quite sure what they do. We <laughs> asked, but they haven't met in a long time. <laughs> but they're required to ask whether you would like to submit a name that you would want to bring that. Let me know if you want to submit somebody's name. And I want to do it. Yeah, we need less school districts, but I can't be the one to say that on the school board. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we'll submit your name. Yeah. There you go, Kayla. Thank you for your volunteers to go to our meetings. Next, <laughs> next item. <laughs> William <laughs> Settlement, <laughs> quarterly uniform complaint report. We didn't get any complaints. Zero. Zero. We're, we're doing well. All right, future business. Oh. Yeah, so meeting so I have um, so you Maddie oh, you, you got it right Maddie oh, well, I guess it's well well uh, well used okay <laughs> so um, trusty cloud okay, how many pages is oh it's really simple um, we're just giving us a reading a homework what an English teacher and you were at the training weren't you <laughs> um how did I, I was talking with Beth Oh, okay. Just because she was on the school boards association, and I was wasn't quite sure what I was doing. As a <laughs> so we per so she suggested yeah. I read that. So this this book comes very highly regarded. We're giving them to you as a gift. Um, I Do believe I have to disclose this on all my election forms? Not this <laughs> one. I believe that there 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 may be a discussion uh, about maybe if this would be a book club type of a discussion we'd want to do in the future, you know, and maybe set it or center it around the spring. But it's it's by uh, Davis Campbell who and Michael Fullen. Um, Davis Campbell is kind of the, the resident expert of school boards in the state. He actually, um, I'm, I'm fortunate to work with him in the Cap Ed program. And Michael Fullen is a internationally uh, known uh, researcher. And it's called the Governance Core. It's how school boards, superintendents, and schools work together. It's a really good book. Um, so we got one for each of you. Thank you. It's and really not. It's 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 not like it's difficult not a, to read. At it's all. Not I was just teasing you. It's like <laughs> English <laughs> teacher book. It's so homework. So, <laughs> I want it annotated and I want it done by this week. It definitely <laughs> is. It's and it's definitely worth having in your, on your on your show. And then also for future business is board office hours. Yes. Um, Maddie and I did it once in September. It was fabulous, and I know that 
we were at Valley Vista and what time of day did you do it? We did it we did it first the thing, eight thirty. But, but, but eight, actually yeah. I think we were there at eight, eight to ten. And there was we, we talked mostly to the PTA. There's three women from the PTA, amazing women. Um, but then, you know, teachers kind of poked their head in a little bit. But I would like to see so that we alternate at schools and we do it at different times. Yeah. Um, maybe Wednesdays when it's a shortened day, um, doing it from like, I don't know. I think a drop off time would be ideal for to get parents and teachers and students. Yeah, I'd love to hear from students. I, I, I want to make sure that we set them up so that teachers have the opportunity. Yeah. You know, and there's always two of us, and that's it. Evening you know, times, too. We, yeah, we could do some evening times. Um, I can only do evening times. Or late afternoon. Um, could you do a morning one? I mean, if you just if you just did an hour? Maybe. Like, just, and then went in at, like, 9? It really depends on the day. Like, we would have to have decided on it already yeah. for me to be able to tell you if I could do yeah, it. Yeah, well, what I would oh, like what to we see need us to do is make, a, yeah. make up a calendar. Yeah. Um, what if we did a, what if we set out some kind of a skeletal Google Doc and you could plug in some signs that might work and you can feed off of somebody else's schedule mm -hmm. and we can see if we can, if we can put matches of two people together. Does it have that too? No, it can only be one. It can't be one. Right, right. It can be one. Yeah. 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 That's good. I just, I would no, like to see it answer. monthly. <laughs> or, or maybe yeah, twice. I think we have to do more. We spread them out. We have a lot. Spread them out. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, there's A and B days yeah. at the yeah. junior high and high yeah. schools. And so if you do a B day, then people who have prep on those days can come. And, you know, so. So somebody had mentioned when we were at Valley Vista that um, the uh, Elementary school teachers get out at like 1.10, but they don't have to start their meetings until 2. Is that? Oh, it depends on the size. Okay. okay. I just want to point out we're also forgetting like CSEA staff and all of this. Like they are oh, no. also important to have at the table. Oh, I'm absolutely. And that's why. Well, if that's they're there at like 7.30 or 8. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like some of them are probably starting at like 6 a.m. And some of them work way late at night. So like there are lots of different right. times. I think if you if if you can get a nice um, smattering of dates and times, yeah. you cover mm -hmm. enough people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know. And if it's published and people know ahead of time, exactly. say, okay, yeah, I'm going to be here then. You know, I'm not going to rush home or whatever, or get there early so I can talk. Especially if we say okay. Thank you. Okay, any other future business? Okay. Well, are we adjourning the closed session or just nope. adjourning? Nope. Wow. Meeting adjourned at 8 o'clock. Woohoo!